and I talk about the concept of virtual organizations. So uh, this actually is uh, our approach to a fundamental problem about how to address uh, this kind of international disaster response. So the primary challenge here is how to securely manage resource sharing, both data and services, between different organizations that would have different um, IT infrastructures. Uh, they need to collaborate you know, on the fly, on demand. Uh, you know, when a disaster happens, you don't necessarily know when or where it's going to happen. So how do you manage the collaboration between these organizations on the fly? So that's what the virtual organization concept um, is meant to address. So uh, what does that mean? So you can think of a VO as a security and collaboration context that is not necessarily associated with any one particular organization or site. So it's an organization in cyberspace. It does have its own rules, roles, and processes, and I'll go through you know, what exactly those can be. Um, basically, a VO has members, and those members are assigned roles and capabilities. And um, that role identity gives them specific actions that they can do within the context of that VO, specific authorizations. When a site decides to participate in a VO, they can contribute uh, data and services, but they always retain control over who gets to use those, whether they are participating in that particular VO or not, or how they choose to make their data and services available. Um, also, very importantly, um, a VO uh, allows a single sign-on capability to be uh, created that when a member logs into a VO, they can immediately find all the data and resources that they are authorized to, to see, to work with, within that context. Okay, so a short way of saying this is that a VO sort of enables, you know, federated community clouds. This notion of federation um, is, is really, you know, boils down to being able to securely collaborate or secure, share data and resources, and that's what we're accomplishing here. Okay. So the way that we did that, did, did this for this particular project, is that we uh, implemented a virtual organization management system within the context of OpenStack. So for those of you that are not familiar, OpenStack is an open source cloud software project. Um, it has thousands of uh, corporate members. There are, no, I, I'm sorry, there are hundreds of corporate members. There are thousands of people that show up at the OpenStack Design Summit. So there's you know, tremendous interest in industry you know, and the government for, uh, for this kind of development. Uh, OpenStack is comprised of many services. So in OpenStack, the keystone service is the security service that does authentication and authorization, and Swift is the object store service. So we modified both of those to be able to um, work, within, work with, um, with this VOMS. Uh, also importantly, that native to OpenStack is this concept of a project. So we extended that concept to uh, include virtual organization projects or VO projects. So here we have uh, you know, three different clouds that are all you know, running along happily independent. Uh, but what we did, as I said, is we modified the keystone to be able to talk to this external VOMS. So this external VOMS server uh, manages or can manage multiple VOs. So for each VO, it keeps track of who the members are, what their roles are, and also which sites are participating. So when a member in any cloud logs into their local cloud, into their local keystone, and if they're logging into a VO project, then that keystone knows to consult the VOMS. If that user is a member of that VO, then they get access to all the other sites that are participating in that VO. So can, um, uh, you know, specifically for data access, okay, uh, so we can apply this to services and data as well, but for this, for this project, we're just looking at data access, that when they do log in, if they are a member, then they get access to all the data containers that are on the different clouds, but only the ones that they're authorized to work with. So they can list, upload, and download files from any of these containers. Now. The, the user doesn't see any of this happen under the covers. They just get a list back of the files and the clouds, you know, which, which uh, clouds that they're on. Um, and they can you know, operate on just those specific containers. Now, the way that 
uh, this actually is used to, uh, to manage data access within, say, a disaster response scenario is illustrated here. On the left, you have all your users from all different organizations, you know, you know, different clouds, whatnot. What the VO does, what the VOMS does, is it maps each one of those users and their native identity to their role identity within that VO. So at a participating site, the local administrator can manage the access control lists on any of these SWIFT containers. So for the medical staff, if they have a container of all the medical data, that they can put those people on the read and write ACLs for that container. And similarly for uh, structural engineers or civic engineers or, or first responders. So a, a site administrator can control the access to those data containers according to the roles that are within that VO. And they, can, they can set these ACLs anytime they want to. So they can grant or revoke access or participation in that VO. So uh, just a couple of comments. Um, I want to make sure that people understand that the VOMS is actually acting as a trusted identity provider. The fact that it is transforming uh, users' native identities to their role identity means that it is acting in, in the capacity as an identity provider. Uh, also, for this demo, we are alighting a number of administrative issues, um, simply things like, you know, how do you create or terminate a VO? Who gets to join and leave? When does that happen? Uh, who gets to be the VO administrator? Who gets to be the VOMS administrator? You know, we did all this kind of stuff by hand uh, for this demo, but you know, these are not insurmountable problems, but uh, in the fullness of time, you know, these kinds of uh, processes would have to be uh, worked out. Uh, also, uh, there is this semantic interoperability or semantic understanding problem of, you know, you know what does a particular VO, what, you know, what's the scope of what it's supposed to do? Uh, what are the meaning of the VO roles within it? Uh, how do you uh, talk to the, to the VOMs? You know, what's that protocol? That all those things would have to be you know, commonly understood across all of the participants. So this is a, just a little bit of the uh, intellectual heritage of where the VO concept came from. We did not invent VOs. Um, this concept was developed in the big science community over the last 10 years. Um, what this picture illustrates is the uh, dashboard of the Worldwide Large Hadron Collider computing grid. So the uh, big particle ring at CERN has you know, four huge detectors on it, and there's thousands of scientists around the world that are collaborating to do experiments and do analyses on the data for you know, the massive amounts of data that's, that's coming off those four sensors. And this is supported by a federation of different computing grids around the world. In Europe, there's the European Grid Infrastructure. Uh, in the US, there's the DOE Open Science Grid. There's the NSF Exceed project, which used to be called TerraGrid, and there's similar organizations in uh, Japan, Korea, uh, Taiwan, and, and other places. And the way that they manage all this, this collaboration, this federation of computing grids, is through the virtual organization concept. Um, I mean, you can go to this website, and you know they're routinely running over 200 VOs to manage different experiments, different collaboration of scientists. Uh, scientists that are working on specific experiments or looking at specific subsets of the data, running different analysis tools. Um, and at this time, there are more than just high-energy physicists using this. There are chemists and, and, and life science groups that are using this infrastructure to collaborate. Um, you know, I, I worked in this area you know, for the last 10 years. Aerospace actually put me on a very long leash to do a three-year stint uh, as the president of the Open Grid Forum that helped uh, these organizations define the standards and best practices that sort of allowed all of this to work. So um, on my last slide, I um, just want to mention some of the uh, things that we could do to expand the capabilities. Uh, for this demo, we just did a very simple account name and password you know, implementation, very simple. For any kind of real-world application, obviously we would want to think about doing a PKI implementa implementation. Um, if we did that, we could also do access-based, uh, I mean attribute-based access control as opposed to role-based. Uh, if you, when you log into a VOMS with a PKI cert, it could actually issue a, a proxy cert that has all of your VO attributes uh, built into it. And that's how we would use, uh, that's how we would implement you know, uh, attribute-based um, uh, access control. Uh, also, I, I already mentioned that you know, we have to have these common definitions for 
uh, what the disaster response roles, attributes, and capabilities are. There needs to be some common understanding of that. Uh, also, even though we manage the access to the data that you can look at across different clouds, um, just because we give you a list of file names doesn't mean that you're going to under understand what's in those files. Um, this goes to the you know, semantic uh, interoperability and semantic understanding that uh, people like Brant uh, Neiman uh, you know, look at. Uh, also, uh, even though we concentrated on just managing data access for this demo, we could apply this concept to managing arbitrary mission level services. And uh, I've actually gotten a little bit of IRAD money for the next fiscal year to, to look at that. Uh, so I'd be happy to, to uh, talk to folks about that if you're interested. Also, this notion of an external VOMS, you know, that's the way that it was implemented in the, the grid world um, you know, way back when. Um, but actually, it would be possible to implement this using peer-to-peer -peer keystone, meaning you, you take the VO state that's in the VOMS and you actually replicate it among all of the participating sites and then have those different sites um, collaborate in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. So that's another uh, implementation uh, choice that would have you know, pros and cons on both sides. Uh, also, I want to mention that um, uh, we really did not address the issue of federated identity management. The VO part basically addresses the federated authorization part as opposed to the uh, authentication part. Um, what federated I identity management really means is that if you have someone from this organization that comes with a PKI cert and somebody else has a Kerberos ticket and a third person has a, a Google ID, um, you know, how do you, you know, manage the authentication process with all these different kinds of identity providers that are out there? So that means you know, being able to understand where is this person coming from, you know, who is their ID provider, what type of ID provider is that? What's the protocol for talking to that ID provider? And are you actually going to you know, trust their, their identity provider? Are you going to trust a, a, a certificate from North Korea? That kind of thing. Um, there's, there's actually um, uh, a proposal from the University of Kent that's been pitched at the OpenStack Design Summit a couple of times. It's working its way through the uh, implementation process. But in the fullness of time, um, I, I think it would be wonderful to actually integrate the virtual organization authentic authorization part with the federated identity management part uh, within the context of uh, OpenStack. Uh, and then finally, there's this notion of an international disaster response trust federation. So I've mentioned this thing about having this common understanding of what the disaster response roles are, what the attributes are, uh, those kinds of things. Um, there would actually need to be, at some point, a human organization that sort of works out all these high-level agreements ahead of time, you know, before the actual need. Um, and, uh, you know, that sort of mirrors what, uh, uh, you know, what, what happens here, because there's actually an international grid trust federation that specifies how all the different organizations have to run their certificate authorities. And uh, when you demonstrate that, that you're doing the right things, then, then all of everybody in the trust federation will trust certificates signed by, by, your, uh, by your CA. So uh, with that, um, uh, it, I'm not going to do a demo right now, but you're going to see VOs be referenced and popped up in, in all of the other um, demonstrations that you'll see.